say I am so honoured to get to do this panel. Thank you, Elliot, for asking me to do this. Um, I'm such a huge fan of Lois's. Some of her credits are The Fifth Element, Saving Private Ryan, Brave Half, for which she won an Oscar, and Ready Player One. But we're here to talk about this movie, which is an extraordinary piece of work. Can I, can I bring you up, Lois, please? Lois, the work looks amazing. Does it still look amazing to you when you see it today? Yes, I, it's, it's kind of different when you look back at something like that because it's always astounding and there's a part of you that doesn't believe you had anything to do with it. It kind of has a life of its own. It's so, it's so beautiful. My first question was, how did you get hired for Legend? Well, I got hired for Legend because I actually met Peter Rob King, who was um, the head of that department makeup department on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And he was very keen on, a film, on my work on a film I did called The Draftsman's Contract. So primarily it was through that. How old were you? 24. Wow. Actually 23 turning 24. Wow. Um, can, can we bring up um, image one please, Josh? Yes, that's uh, Tim, as he was in our makeup room in F Block at Pinewood, and that's Nick Dubman there, who um, the pair of us worked on uh, Darkness together. Originally, obviously, it was Rob Bottin's design, and uh, Rob and Vince did the makeup test. But after that, uh, there were alterations in the in the makeup, and when we came to do the film, it was Nick and myself that did it. How long did it take the first time you did that makeup? Well, the first time it was touching about seven, seven and a quarter hours because we hadn't done it before. Um, but we got it down to five and a half hours. Wow, five and a half hours. And well, it, it was also because that, that sounds sort of ridiculous every day, but we actually worked French hours, uh, which meant that the filming crew came in at 11 or 11.30, and we started at five in the morning. And then we began the work and shooting day at 11 and went until, well, midnight, 2 o'clock, whatever. Was, is this the hardest movie physically you've ever done? No, not physically. I mean, I think that it's the, it was definitely the longest hours, uh, day after day. But physically, actually, the hardest film I've ever done was War Horse, which doesn't look like it, but my God, those trenches and those hills and that mud and cold, that was, that was tough. Um, can we, um, how did the makeup change over the period? And, and Josh, can we bring up the next image, please? Um, yeah, the, well, the makeup changed because we had certain areas that we had to um, change because the, the horns, when they were inserted, as you can see there on the left, into those ratchets, um, when the horns were there, it would put terrible kind of weight on the cap. So it would pull forward or then pull back and be very uncomfortable and create actually sort of lesions if you weren't careful. So Nick redevised the cap that went underneath. We had to always apply. Nick always did the face pieces. Um, I did the back and chest with Nick in the morning. And then I went off and did my other artists who were gump and actually as the makeup department became smaller over a period of time, <laughs> we, we actually increased in the amount of cast we were doing. Um, so I would go off and do my cast while Nick applied the face pieces, which couldn't be pre-painted because an expander had to be used. So it just meant that it made it fit the face where it wasn't, it wasn't fitting, it would shrink, the foam pieces would shrink. Anyway, so what happened was that um, then Nick would go off and do his cast and then I would come back and do all the colouring. Did you have a name for that headpiece? Did you call it something? No, we didn't, but that's a very good idea we should have done. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Can we show the, the next clip? You disgust me. You are nothing but an animal. <laughs> we are all animals, my lady. Most are too afraid to see it. Damn you! Oh! Drop all of us down. Makeup. Can you talk about the tongue? 
Yes, I, I think you could see it in that clip sort of well. Um, but we hit upon this idea of having a slightly darkened tongue. Well, there isn't a dye you can do that with, but fortunately, Tim was very fond of licorice. And there was a particular English sweet called blackjacks. And you used to be able to get four of them for a penny. I don't know if you remember them, Dave. I do. Yeah, exactly. So, and they would always dye your tongue black. So we went through bags and bags of these blackjack sweets. Because in the end, I think Tim Soul, who was covered, I mean, you have to think what he went through. I mean, us doing the work was one thing but him actually going through this entire process and delivering that kind of performance is something else. Could, how, how often, just because it's so interesting, the idea of these blackjacks, how often would he have to eat them to keep it continuity on the tongue? Oh, well, the continuity is all over the shop. I'm the first to, I'm the first to confess that. Yeah. But when it came for a close-up in the end, he'd lick it and then I'd kind of rub it on his tongue a bit because he didn't want to chew it. <laughs> um, can you talk about removing that makeup as well? Yeah, removing the makeup was, was fun. In fact, um, I, not to get too personal, but we had to sort of in the beginning soak Tim in a bath because he was covered from the hips up. And it depended on, uh, anyone from the makeup world will tell you, it depends on how long you're in the makeup, how easy it is to remove because sweat and and bodily wear actually helps in the removal process. And if, if you're in for a very, you know, in the makeup only for an hour and then you get out of it, it takes far longer and you have to use extreme care, especially with the makeup as complex as this. Um, so we would soak Tim in a, in a bath of what was Friends Cleanse, which had a kind of yellow color. And what happened, was that Tim at one occasion blamed me for spots on his bottom because he was sitting in this oily bath. And then we occasionally, and I know this sounds really naughty, but you have to understand it was so, the hours were so long uh, that we would occasionally have a small beer at the end of the working day. And the Friends Cleanse bore an uncanny resemblance to lava. So, to a light beer. So every now and then we all took a swig of the wrong thing, which was the right <laughs> Can you also talk about the purchase of a stepladder? Ah, now, I wanted, the, I wanted an American makeup box, you know, an on-set box, and they were really beautiful, and they are very expensive, and I didn't have the funds at that time. And Peter Rob King called me into his makeup room and said, uh, I've got something for you behind the door. So I was really excited. I thought, oh, I'm going to get an American makeup box. You know, I was really thrilled by this. No, all I could see, and I said, well, what is there behind the door? And it was a, a pair of step ladders, kind of small, lightweight, aluminium ones, because when Tim was in, on his stilts, he was you know, seven foot tall. So I couldn't reach his face. And because he was on stilts, he couldn't bend down in order to, you know, facilitate my reach. So part of my makeup equipment was a pair of ladders. <laughs> and there was one other character you did that you had to completely focus on that character as well, right? Yes. They wouldn't let someone else touch them, it had to be you. No, yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? How, how was that? How did you manage that? Well, I mean, it's rather like, I think that that when you have more than one character, or actually in the makeup world in general, I mean, all the makeup artists here I think can testify to this, it's rather like being a plate spinner. So you're, you dash over here and when that starts to go wobbly, you're repairing you know, that beard or that ear or that appliance or that lipstick, whatever it is. And then you look over there and that one's starting to you know, fall apart. So, you try and prevent it all the time, but it really is like being a circus act of a plate spinner. And did they work a lot together at the same time? Actually, a few, yes, actually, I suppose about a week and a half, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was tricky, but the, the, no one else would do that. David Bennett, no. Yeah, I think it's also such a testament to you that that was what they both wanted. Well, yes, I suppose. I don't know. I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> 
Could we, could we see the next image, please, Joss? Wow, that's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. That's beautiful. When you brought the pieces from America, yeah. what was it like when you, you first opened them up? What, what, did you, what was the first thought that came to you? Well, we didn't see them for some time, actually. But when we did see them, um, well, it's a, it's a wonderful design. I mean, it's a great design, and it's a lovely sculpt. You know, that is absolutely undeniable, and it's an iconic figure. I mean, I, I, you know, hands down, it's a, it's a wonderful design. And when, so obviously, you have the ability to do the lenses, but I shouldn't think you would be able to because, because you were so covered in make makeup. Who, who did the lenses for that? Darkness? Well, there was Richard Glass, which sounds like a pun because <laughs> he did opti optical work. But yeah, Richard Glass, and there were um, lab techs, you know, optician techs that came in. And in fact, that led to the, the uh, wearing the scleral lenses and the tests afterwards to see if there was any tear um, uh, uh, substances used um, to the. Well, actually, do you want to move on to. Yeah, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 wrong one. That's Nick Dubner. Um, but actually, that's the cap. So there you are, that's the thing that was designed. Really like had you it. worked with Nick before this? Um, yeah, yeah, I had. I worked with him on a very tiny film. So we. we knew each other from there, but we knew each other because we were the kind of the same age range and youngsters and we would go to meetings to talk about makeup and that kind Was of thing. Was it, I mean, is it like one of those experiences to do a makeup like this with someone that only the person that's with you can really know the true story or what that really felt like? Because it seems so intense and it almost feels like five people should have been on that makeup, not, not, not two. Yeah, and yes, it is. I mean, it's rather like, I don't know, for, for the non-makeup people here, it, have you ever folded a blanket and with one of your family? So you know that rhythm. And the pair of you can fold a sheet or a blanket better than you can with a stranger. That's what it's like when you double team. And actually, there are either, you, most people can double team, but to double team well, is something else. It's it's literally like that. You can fold a blanket with anyone, but you do it with someone that you know really well, and you know where your hands are going, and all those things. It makes it much easier. When you do a movie like this, was your whole? Because I remember you telling me you had a flat, but you were like, it, the hours must have been so long. Your life must have been in a complete disarray outside of this film. Oh God, yeah, there, there was no life. Yes. Yeah. And it was a long shoot. I mean, it was nine months. It was a long shoot, longest shoot I've ever done. And how many days did Tim Curry work in that makeup? Do you know, I can't remember. I was trying to remember, and I don't want to say it inaccurately, but I would say at least a month, 31 days, something like that. Can we go to the next clip, please? Oh, yes, there we are. There's Nick and I talking about double teaming, you see, on the set together. Was that... When you were doing that, what was that like the first time the audience, uh, the, the crew saw that makeup? Well, you have to bear in mind that there have been, you know, sort of other creatures as well. There was no one in that film that looks regular other than, you know, Tom Cruise. Yeah. Um, so I think everyone was kind of adjusted to it. But even so, I mean, Tim, the thing is, it was Tim's presence. It's not just the makeup. Yeah. The makeup is part of it. The other part. The bigger part is the person who brings that alive. Well, um, can we move? Yeah, that's a great statement. Thank you. There you are doing his makeup. Yeah. And I mean, did you realise at that moment how important this would be in your career? This this movie. No. Was it just you were just doing a job and you just had to do your job? It's not. Yes. I mean, I knew it was. I knew it was a reach, but the thing is, you just put what you climb Everest one foot at a time. You don't by putting one foot in front of the other. So to actually think this is going to bring me X or this is going to do Y, all of that has to just be thrown out the window, and and you concentrate on what you're doing at that time and make it as bearable as it can be for the actor. 
and as correct as it can be for the story. And, and Lois, one of the things about this is, is like, so there's not really any part of his body that isn't covered in makeup. So how, when, if, if you're coming into that as a new maker, how do you approach stuff? Do you just sort of come in, chat, and just do it and get on with it? Or, because it seems like it could be almost, you yeah. must get to know each other really well. Oh, God, really well, yeah. I mean, there, and there are some things about that because in fact, the mouth area here is all Tim, you know, apart from the, where the chin comes. So this is all Tim and the eye area. And I had an idea that rather than just have black lids, which was the original discussion, that I wanted the darkness to have a, a sensuality about him, a kind of version of Greta Garbo, so that when he looked down, there was something appealing, almost coy, um, and the lip shape, because oh, Tim's got most fabulous lips anyway, so it lent itself perfectly. But just to exaggerate it slightly, so it was it was almost feminine, and you know, before you see the teeth, just just that. And of course, you know, the the very being, the physicality, the expression that Tim could bring out, considering he was covered from the hips up. But yes, uh, and I remember him saying to me right at the end, and actually this was a real lesson because it hadn't crossed my mind before because you're doing what you're doing, you know. And when you're, you're looking at someone's face but you're looking at the makeup but you're, and you're looking at them in the mirror but you're not conscious of you. Of you. you. You are invisible and disappear. It's the work you're doing. And he said to me at the end, you know, I don't think I could have sat in the chair or done this makeup if you hadn't had nice eyes to look at. Wow. Now, I had no idea he was looking. I'd agree with that. You do have very kind eyes. Okay. Very, very kind <laughs> eyes. No, um, right. can, you talk, can you talk about working with Tim Curry and what he was like as a performer? And Yes, I mean, has everyone got three hours? Because he's just fantastic. Well, this is a great picture of Tim because he was fun. You can see that he was fun, he was kind, he has a great sense of humour, a great sense of, of, I think, not only discipline, I mean, a wonderful version of discipline because that was hard to do that performance. Um, but also he was just a, a terrific person. He never complained, he wasn't a moaner. He didn't, he was very good at keeping himself during the day. You know, you wouldn't come back and find, you know, he'd blown his nose or done something. Oh, and in wish. fact, when he had the hands, this is when we'd worked out how to take the hands off. But there was, for the longest period, the hands and the arms were all one. And we couldn't, you know, we weren't about to interfere with the design and, you know, get into trouble in any shape or form. But in the end, we had to, because the poor soul, with those acrylic nails being the way they were, as you, know, as you can see in the film, he couldn't go to the toilet by himself. I mean, that's not yeah. fun. And he couldn't feed himself either. So I would, when we, we didn't actually break for lunch, we just shot continuously, but there was food there, so I would get something. And I remember one day, it was, uh, you know, mince and peas and mashed potato in a little bowl, and he had a special chair in his office still, to be, it was still in a special chair to sit in. And I would, you know, spoon and, you know, feed him. And this one day, I was feeding Tim, and I suddenly looked down and realized, we, I was so tired actually, that we'd already taken the hands off, so he could have had it. <laughs> he might have liked it though. He might have liked being fed. I think I like that, that'd be cool. Can we show the next image? <laughs> and then, why don't we go to the next, I think it's a, a clip next. I yes. Think. Black embrace. 
the optician so um, uh, there's a fluorescent that's put in the eye to, after you've had sclerals or haptics in to see if there's any kind of blood left from any um, blood vessel any floor it comes up as a, a black speck but while that happens a UV light actually makes the eye glow and if you blow your nose or you cough or you have a drippy nose that also fluoresces and I really like the idea of that. So literally one day there was Nick, myself, before we went to Peter Rob King or, or, or Ridley, um, and I said, you know what, we could, why don't we use that? Could we soak the lenses so that they actually fluoresce? And we could just use UV paint on the nails, but then we could make darkness black. And you know, Tim thought that that was a smashing idea. So that's what we did, and that's how that came about. So basically, it was the pieces that some of which were already pre painted that were red, and I painted them black. And it goes from black, absolutely soot black through up to silver and white. That's that on the body and on the face. Yeah, because yeah, you can really see it's such a beautiful texture and color. Such a beautiful. What was. What did, what did you think, you talked a bit about it, but talk about Tim Curry's performance in this movie. Oh, well, Tim's performance is, was sensational. One of my favourite parts is when he comes down the table and just, you know, moves like this and is throwing things off the table and frightening uh, the princess. But he's, he brought the makeup alive. He could stand there and recite the, the telephone directory and it'd make it interesting he has a gift he's a consummate actor and just can bring any anything anyone to life all his characters are like that and and such a super person because there's no there's no you know don't speak to me i have to concentrate on this or that he's himself right up until that moment and then suddenly from being lovely tim there's darkness, and you're all a bit nervous. Can we show the next clip, please? I, I, I think the, I think the, I think the main thing is that I've I've always I knew an actor said to me once, um, "When did you decide?" Because he asked me for my opinion, and I said, "Are you certain?" And he said, "Yes." So I gave my opinion on something outside of work, and he said, "When did you decide not to be pleasing?" And, <laughs> And I was kind of slightly taken back. I said, well, you didn't, you, it was something that you asked my opinion on. Out of respect for you, I'm going to tell you what my opinion was on something. Um, and I decided a long time ago that I can't, I can't be a performer in my work or in my life. You're gonna spend 40 years working. Am I going to pretend to be someone I'm not? I don't think so in order to engage or you know have a career or any of those things you have i think you have to be yourself i don't know if that helps i think we can do this last this last question or the last two and i think we'll run out of time oh i i was wondering how was did you have a collaboration with 
costume as well with the makeup? Like, did you guys have an influence with each other, or were they kind of just separate? No, well, it was sort of presented to us, but in the end, to work out the hands and the cuffs and all those things. I mean, that was a costumier that did that, as well as the costume designer. You know, yes, you, 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 you do work together. You do work together on things. It's always better. The thing is that all films are better if you work as a team, you know. That, that, that's, that's the fact. There has to be collaboration. I think of it as being an orchestra. If you think that the best piece of music, not everyone can be the first violinist. Someone's got to be there at the back with the triangle. But when you need the triangle, that's the most important thing. That's how films are made. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think that's it. There's no other Is question. That it? We have one. For, we have time for one more, if someone wants to. Yes, please. Oh. So you've worked with so many faces uh, over the years. Which facial feature do you think is the the window into the soul? Always the eyes. Oh. Always the eyes. Um, can. Uh, you know, guys, we're going to show the final clip. I want to say, do you, know, do you think, I, I, what I found exciting about this is we got to talk about this, but what I found frustrating is there's so much more to talk about in your career. I wonder if I ask Elliot if we could, I mean, wouldn't it be cool to talk about Lois' like, whole career and really get into like this amazing body of work? Wouldn't that be fun? Okay, can we, can we show the final clip, please, guys? No, thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you to all of you.